welcome back. Uh, this is part two of my conversation with uh, Dan Bao from RMIT on research integrity. Yeah, I mentioned before around your uh, your involvement uh, both in uh, organizations like the uh, WCRI and uh, in Asia specifically as well with, with APEC. Mm -hmm. um, I'm keen to hear a little bit more around uh, the projects, the APEC project in particular. Um, could you give us a quick summary of, of what that involves and what you hope to come out of that project? The Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation is a collection of really diverse, what they term economies across the Asia Pacific, um, across North Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia, Latin America, North America. Groups within the, the, the APEC identified that there was, you know, a lack or an absence of a shared understanding of the principles of research integrity and that that actually may affect um, things such as collaboration and exchange across the APEC. In particular, researcher mobility. So the idea of um, having a harmonised or at least shared understanding of, of honest and trustworthy research would help facilitate the movement of researchers across um, and between APEC economies, across boundaries throughout our APEC. This is interesting. I think it's a, it's, it's, it, there is a perceived issue here. People have found or argued that the principles of research integrity underpin you know, the positive impact of research, which they do. They underpin practices, responsible practices, which they do. There are also arguments to say that the principles of research integrity underpin excellent research, a really, really high quality research. And we've seen in other activities from the Montreal Statement or others, for example, activities to say research integrity is really important in collaboration. Research and mobility hadn't been described in this way, but it's an interesting issue. To address this, um, we're privileged to um, do research and undertake consultation and um, other processes to come up with a consensus set of guiding principles for research integrity um, across APEC. Um, these shared principles are you know, fairly high level um, but then are used to inform certain practices for researchers and administrators and also funders. Um, the principles are honesty, uh, responsibility, transparency, rigour, fairness, respect and diversity. And diversity was the one that perhaps there isn't necessarily a consensus around, but it's a very interesting one, a principle that recognises the the great diversity across APEC economies and the research sectors and the need for recognising that so that all the research could be trusted and the conduct could be trusted. So we went through a research process to develop this uh, consensus and those are the principles recently been uh, at least drafted and we're looking to then use these in a document that's not binding but that can then, then be used across APEC to help with research mobility and other initiatives such as policy or education and training. What do you see, uh, talking about uh, research mobility, do you see there being in future potentially some kind of passport or kind of credential that, that uh, a researcher, researcher can, can undertake that will be you know, recognised across either region or even the, the world to say, okay, this is someone who's undertaken research integrity training or, you know, they, they um, yeah, some, some evidence of, of practice with integrity? Is that something that you see being possible? I think it's, it'd be a great possibility uh, for the APEC work, that project, because the, those principles define what research integrity is. And so if you have an understanding or awareness of that, and that understanding is relatively shared across various economies or boundaries or places, then an indicator or marker of that understanding it should be powerful. I mean, universities in, within Australia have shared resources or approached um, similar education and training modules and uh, solutions in research integrity and tried to do, certainly do that in some, with some shared way so that we could say, well, someone at my institution has done the same training you've done, uh, you, uh, you provide, excuse me. And so that sort of, that should add confidence, that should add and build trust. Um, certainly the APEC guiding principles for research integrity, they they could underpin that. And APEC has been very successful in, in uh, certainly helping with mobility and exchange in, economic, in, in the no economic sense. And why wouldn't that then occur? And 
in a research or researcher sense. That'd be makes sense to me. Yeah, it seems to to me as well have a lot of value and especially with uh, education becoming more and more global and, yeah. and you know the desire for uh, universities to attract um, uh, and the competition for universities to attract researchers that um, you know some some kind of model that enables integrity to be upheld would be would be advantageous I would think well yeah we'll, we'll think about well there, what other markers are there yeah so you've published a paper yeah um, you from a prestigious institution um, you you seem like a really wonderful person. Um, there, there, there probably aren't any direct no. markers. No, um, and as you saw with the, <laughs> the Swin, Swinburne case recently, right? Right. Where, um, that was something that happened previously, but obviously there'd been no, wasn't aware when Swinburne uh, hired the person. So, right. Um, you know, these are important considerations. I think increasingly institutions are, are putting into their 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 considerations of how do they want to serve their communities or through research. So how do they want to solve the great problems? Or how do they want to engage with industry? How do they want to do basic research? What's the best way? Well, research integrity and the principles for research of research integrity apply to all research, regardless of the scope or discipline area. So why wouldn't we have uh, some direct markers that people understand them and have some training? And you could look at a university as well for some markers. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly could. Okay, so my last question, um, and I guess uh, you can take this two ways, so I'll, I'll kind of post the question and, and, and you can run with it, but do you think, we've spoken before about is there enough importance at a high level of, of either government or universities around research integrity? So I guess my the open question is, do you think there is, or where do you see things standing in terms of research integrity as a, as a priority? Um, and if you think more needs to be done or it needs to be raised as a, as a priority, um, how, what can be done about it? How, how can it be, how can universities put more onus on research integrity? Um, and how can the community as a whole, I think, not just because it's not just up to the, the universities, it's up to yeah. the researchers as well, right? The individual. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they're, the, they're doing the heavy lifting. Um, Oh, it's again. It, it's an interesting question. I, I guess it's a question that actually lacks evidence. For example, how seriously do do institutions or researchers, for example, across Australia, take research integrity? Anecdotally, they appear to take it very seriously. So, in both when I say they, I mean both researchers and also institutions, representatives of institutions. Um, they speak uh, passionately about it. They um, support it uh, to a certain degree. Um, they, they sometimes don't articulate it in the way that would suggest that we're all going in the same direction or approaching it from the same way. But so there are some issues there. So what, what could we do? Um, we could try and understand if it is a priority and why it, why, why it isn't. Clearly it should be if we're w wishing to deliver impact through research. The positive impact of research is dependent on research integrity and research that lacks integrity can lead to very negative uh, research impact. So very, very harmful things for the society or economics or for the environment. So what could we do? I mean, um, other places around the world, other communities or countries have gotten uh, networks together, very successful ones within the Netherlands, within Japan, that. Um, from the very initial inception, tapped into this obvious latent interest and need, uh, this unmet challenge for researchers, for administrators, academic leaders, um, students, others to get together to talk about research integrity, to, to better define their understanding of it, but also to develop uh, not only solutions, but as you mentioned, advocacy. It's interesting, I think, for institutions, there are lots of uh, things pulling them in different directions for research. Um, and the environment's really complex and a global one. We're not measuring research integrity, really, or the responsible kind of research, really directly anywhere. And, and typically, you get what you measure. There's a lot of measurement. There's the measurements of individuals. There's measurements of, of institutions uh, within research appear to be quality markers of uh, 
or indicators of activity or quality. And you could say with a fair amount of confidence that we're not measuring um, direct indicators for trustworthy research or essentially research integrity at a researcher or at a at a institution level. There has been some activity around this, especially in looking at journals, and publishers, some act certainly some very, very smart and innovative work looking at how you might measure researchers. Some of that work has been recently done, was recently done at the World Conference on Research Integrity in Hong Kong, which was co-organized by RMIT with, with HKU. And then you get to institutions. And for Australia, where one of our biggest exporters is education, and there are lots of rankings of universities for, for example, research activity or other academic indicators of quality or success, none of those really are measuring uh, indicators of trustworthy research or, or research integrity. I mean, how would you do that? You might look at the whether there are policies for research integrity within institutions. You might then have to look at um, the quality of those. Um, you may look at retractions. You might look at very, very simple bibliometric indicators that suggest institutions are being responsible for correcting the literature. And when I say you might look at retractions within a ranking of an institution, retractions would be a positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, exactly what this looks like, it's, it, we don't know yet, but some research that I'm very passionate about doing, and I'm sure that would be informed greatly by some activities that have been done uh, recently around the world, including at the World Conference. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we, uh, we had Phil, um, Phil Beatty on from Times Higher Rankings recently, yeah. and we discussed the idea of, you know, do you see uh, integrity rankings coming? And he, was, <laughs> he wasn't totally against it, so maybe there's, maybe there's an opportunity for them to expand into that field as well. I think, as you say, it's, it's a hard thing to measure, for sure. Yep. Um, but um, they seem to be measuring everything else at universities, so you know, why, why, not, why not try to measure that as well, I guess? I think it's, yeah. like you say, unless you're really measuring something or finding out the scale of it, then how do you know what the solution is, right? How do you, how do you know? You know it's, uh, I think it, it ties into you know, other themes, for example, with uh, contract cheating and things. Mm. Um, you know, that's a hot topic in, in Australia as well. You know, if if there's not an understanding of, of how major the issue is, then mm. you're not gonna it's not gonna be raised as a first step, but then you don't know, you know, how do you solve something if you don't know it's how it's happening, where it's happening and, and yeah. whether to uphold it. So I mean that's true for education and training solutions. Um, there was a the nice Cochran review by a number of authors, very well established experts, research integrity, that found most um, I mean there's no almost no evidence to support the education training and research integrity prevents breaches. Uh, the only the only thing that looks like it works are uh, uh, training approaches to prevent plagiarism, so academic writing skills. And it's and it's true too. I mean, why would you build a ranking where you would you potentially generate competitive environment for research integrity, which could be a very good thing for trustworthy research. Maybe a more meaningful and less a less cynical approach would be at least to as you say, measure uh, certain characteristics of what we think research integrity in institutions or the responsible environments, the best environments for responsible research in institutions look like. Measure those and build at least some program or systematic way of supporting research institutions to achieve that. And that might be done through something similar to an accreditation program, which again is strange that we don't have that yet. Um, this is a global problem, a global issue, and a global opportunity. Um, understanding research integrity, putting it, uh, initiatives in place to support it can only benefit great research. Definitely. And through that benefit society as a whole, I think, uh, for sure. Okay. I mean, I think, you know, we've, uh, over the past few years, as I've got to understand research integrity more and your work more, I, I do definitely feel like... You know, a lot of time and effort and um, money has been spent educating undergraduate students around academic integrity and things. And um, there has been maybe a bit less focus from the community at large 
around research and and I hope that but it, I think it is starting to change now I think the work mm. that you're doing others are doing and the profile of the WCRI and other organizations that and you know I hope if we're sat, sat down together in another two years that we'll have seen a lot of progress mm. and a lot more uh, attention being paid to it so I look forward to uh, to inviting you on again and uh, updating the conversation thank you thanks for watching everyone hope you enjoyed that episode and we'll see you again soon <laughs>